There are 2,000 people in this auditorium. How about a round of applause for the people that put this together? How many of you are between the ages of 18 and 45? Uh, show me with your hands or applause, please. This talk is dedicated to you. The most common reason that people between the ages of 18 and 45 develop sudden visual loss is optic neuritis. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about is optic neuritis, what that is like and seeking a treatment for it. The second thing I want to talk about is the will to try. Not like Clarence the fish, the will to try, <laughs> but the will to do better, the will to be your best. And then the third thing is I want to talk to you about the value of research. How if you do research here in East Lansing, you can change the world. I guarantee it. So optic neuritis is an inflammation of the optic nerve, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. The will to try is basically getting better, trying new things. I am, in essence, a party animal. But this story, well, you're laughing, but <laughs> my story is turning from a party animal into a clinical investigator. Unbelievable. But it took the will to try. The third thing is the importance of research, and hopefully I'll be able to impart that to you. We work at a great university, and one of the major things that we do here is research. And I'd like to give you a sense of what that feels like. Now, way back when, when I was Clarence the Fish, I looked like this. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I had a great time. I was all about fun. College was the best six or seven years of my life. <laughs> I was going to take a master's in fun. And if that worked out, a PhD. And then disaster struck. Yeah. So this is somebody that would try different things. She was great at music, great at dance, great at psychology, great at research, great at medicine. She went to med school, and that inspired me. And I thought to myself, gee, I'd like to try to go to med school one day. I'd like to do that. Her response was immediate and not so pleasant. <laughs> she laughed her behind off, and she said, why? You never try. You never do your best. You got to try. And I listened to that, and somehow, some way, I got to med school. And uh, I thought med school would be all about uh, fast cars and a lot of money and glamour, but it's not. Medical school is putting your lips up to the fire hydrant of knowledge, and then determined faculty turn on the juice. In six weeks, you look and feel like this. And then it gets worse. After that, I did a residency in neurology and then went on to become a brain doctor, a thing called a neuro-ophthalmologist, a brain doctor that specializes in visual loss related to brain disease. Then something great happened. I came to Michigan State University, probably around 1855 when I first showed up here. <laughs> and the thing about our university is it wishes to be elite without being elitist. Now, I want you to think about that, elite without being elitist. That provides an environment for you to try, try various things, and that's what makes Spartans great, that attitude. Now, a little bit about optic nerve and optic neuritis. So the optic nerve is this thing right here. Here's the eye, there's the squash. The eye takes information through the optic nerve. So all the information from the eye comes through the optic nerve and then back to the brain. When your optic nerve is inflamed, it's called optic neuritis. If your appendix is inflamed, we call it appendicitis, itis meaning inflammation. When your optic nerve is inflamed, it means optic neuritis. Now, optic neuritis affects you, kids between the ages of 18 and 45. And as I've mentioned, it is the most common reason that you will suddenly lose vision. It may or may not be related to multiple sclerosis, a disease that not only blinds but cripples, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Basically, the center portion of your vision is down, and 
interestingly, when you look at the eye, the back of the eye, the nerve itself is normal. So 65% of the time when an eye doctor looks into the eye, it looks normal, yet you're blind. Now the question is, how do you treat optic neuritis? That's a good question. That's a good question. Now when I asked my teachers how to treat optic neuritis, they were very specific. Here's an example of one of my teachers. <laughs> he was tough. He said, use lower dose oral prednisone, 60 milligrams. Use 60 milligrams of prednisone. And I said, why? Gandalf, why? Why 60 milligrams? <laughs> and he, you know, he said something about some rings or something. I don't know what it was. But then he, then he said, then he said, look, that's the way the ancients taught me. Older than you, Gandalf? Yes. The ancients taught me, and that's what you're going to do, kid. Do you get it? 60 milligrams of prednisone when someone comes in with that. I said, how can you be sure? And away he went. Here at Michigan State, I began to think about that, and I began to think about scientific method, and then I realized the National Institutes of Health was going to create a trial to look at this, to try to answer this. Is giving somebody oral prednisone, 60 milligrams a day, any better than doing nothing, like placebo? Or was the emerging literature that 1,000 milligrams a day, 15 times the dose, the way to go, like the transplant literature suggested? And that was sort of an interesting thing. Which of these three treatments would be the best? And we wanted to make some decisions about that scientifically. And I realized that the National Eye Institute had put together a study to look at this. But I knew that I would never be part of that study. After all, I was at a university where the medical schools were just emerging, that really uh, we did not have a department of neurology at that time, and there was no chance. I couldn't compete against the guys at Hopkins or the University of Iowa or New York or even the University of Michigan. Couldn't do it. And then that blonde shows up again. And she says, did you forget everything that I taught you what about the will to try? Try. So what I remember most is she and I Xeroxing some stuff 12 hours before the deadline and submitting the stuff. Nine months later, a guy gets on the phone by the name of Roy Beck, and he says, uh, we're going to take you. We want you to be part of this study. You're the youngest guy there, but we want you to be part of the study. Now, there's no way to tell you what the emotion is like to turn from Clarence the Fish into a guy invited to do an NIH research trial. All I can share with you is the emotion of the moment was similar to this moment, the moment of triumph of our team at the Rose Bowl. But that's the way it felt. That's the way it felt. Now, my team was a little bit different, no shoulder pads or anything like that. <laughs> now, this is Roy Beck. This is the primary investigator. This is the guy that put together uh, the parent grant, and now the closer you're standing to Roy Beck, uh, the more famous you are and the more important you are. Now here's Mark Cooper Smith from New York, Keltner from California is here, here's John Trobe from the University of Michigan, and I'm located there. <laughs> I did not find that funny. So we talked about it, well, which would be the best way to handle this, and so Roy Beck says at our first meeting, how many people in the audience think that 1,000 milligrams of steroids is the way to treat optic neuritis? Half the people put up their hands. How many people think low-dose steroids is the best way? Half the people put up their hands. Then he looks at me, he says, you, the, the kid from Michigan State, you didn't vote. Why didn't you vote? And I said, uh, well, Dr. Beck, uh, we don't know the answer to that question. That's why we're all here. And they all turned around and they stared at me, and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> But then he said, that's what we want. We want that sort of will. Now, you come down here and you be part of the executive committee. Couldn't believe it. Five years later, five years later, this slide came out. And after five years of work, 457 patients, what we realized was the people that got new attacks of optic neuritis, not only one attack of blindness, but then a second attack, was more common in Gandalf's method that the way we used to treat the disease, oral prednisone, 60 milligrams, was not only not effective, it caused more episodes of blindness. That high-dose steroids did not cause more episodes of blindness, 
and we published and then went global. I think in your language that means going viral. And that's what happened. So the IV stuff proved to be more effective than oral, and I'm telling you, my lifelong ambition to do something for the blind was accomplished. But there was more. The group stayed together, and we wanted to see the relationship between this disease and multiple sclerosis, a disease that not only blinds but cripples. And five years later, after that, what we realized is that this high-dose steroid stuff allowed multiple sclerosis to be shielded. In other words, the people that got the high-dose steroids went on to develop clinically definite multiple sclerosis at a slower rate than placebo. So the high-dose IV steroids for a couple of years shielded people from the development of multiple sclerosis. I understood right then, I understood that this was something terrific. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe I was part of it. And now I think about this group. I think about them often. We stood together for 20 years, multiple scientific papers, and I thought, what was so special about this group? What was so unique? And I realized what was unique is they had the will to try. And it was infectious. And we infected each other with the will to try and developed the will to win. When you put together a group that inspires one another, you develop the will to win. Then the moment came to write the law. All the papers had come out. We knew that high-dose IV solumedrol was the way to treat optic neuritis, the way to start the treatment with multiple sclerosis. And then they had to make a decision. Who should write the law? Because if you don't write it, then people can do what they wish. But once the practice parameter comes out, that's it. That's the law. That's what you have to do. And they looked around, and they chose the youngest among them. They asked me. I don't know why, uh, but they gave me that, and that meant the world. So what am I trying to tell you here? Number one, have the will to try. You have no idea. You can turn from a party animal into whatever it is I've become. <laughs> you can do great things. Number two is the value of research. Here in East Lansing, you can do work. You can do work that will change the way we handle things worldwide. I'm here to tell you that. And number three is when you find a mentor that is unique and special, hold on to them. Thank you.